Um, I can see you yeah. as a front man, actually, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You've got that yeah. angsty look about you. Yeah, a sting-like figure playing yeah. bass up at the front. Sting. Yeah, <laughs> but a bit of tantric sex, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely going to be good. Love it. Love it. <laughs> good morning, Vietnam! I love the smell of red pump in the morning. You're going to need a bigger one. I feel the need. The need for speed. Rose. We're going, we don't need. I told you that I want to go to that festival in Sweden. No, you said it would be cool to go. Yeah, and then I got the opportunity and I decided Look, I to do it. I don't mind you going. I just wish you would have told me. That's all. Dude, she needs a therapist. You've been wanting out of this stupid relationship for like a year now. And don't forget about all of the beautiful Swedish women you'll meet in June. Okay, guys. That's not her again. Seriously? Babe, what's happening? Danny. Welcome everybody back to the Mavis Grimble podcast. The Dark Knights are here and so are we. Joining me as usual, Mary, how are you tonight? I'm good, how are you? I am not too bad. I'm not loving these Dark Knights to be honest with you. It takes me a few weeks to kind of adjust, but we have got a spooky podcast planned, so maybe it's good that it is dark. John, how are you? Yeah, I am same as you. Uh, adjusting badly to the, uh, the the darkness. I went in, I popped into my work yesterday at four o'clock, and then came back out at five o'clock, and it was pitch black. And I was really, really annoyed. <laughs> what kind of work do you have that you can just pop in at four and leave at five? I need your job. <laughs> I just needed, and I needed to pick something up from my work. That was all. It wasn't a a work day. I'm not that dedicated. <laughs> I like the dark nights though. Winter's when I thrive. It's all chunky jumpers, cozy nights in, books, candles, all that sort of thing. This is me coming into my Wednesday Adams. I love it. I mean, I get where you're coming from, but it's cold. Is it Scotland? I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, but, uh, we do have some podcast listeners abroad, so you don't understand how cold it gets in Scotland. It's cold, it's dark, it's Halloween this week. Why not? review one of the year's most talked about horror films and Ari Aster's Midsummer. Midsummer is Ari Aster's follow-up to his cult hit from a couple of years ago, Hereditary. Um, it's set in the US and Sweden. It's a film about a group of students and a girl who travel to Sweden uh, to witness uh, a midsummer festival in the wilds of the uh, the Swedish North, where it never gets dark. The main character, Danny, uh, has just recently suffered a, a massive bereavement, which has really uh, changed her life. And she's looking for something to try and get herself back on an even keel. Uh, she doesn't think that the trip's going to do that, but she, it gives her a bit of space and time to actually work out what's actually going on with her life. Now, obviously, with the fact that it's an Ari Aster film, Things may not be as it seems. Everything seems very gentle and nice to begin with, but as the nine days of the midsummer festivities begin, things start to change, both in terms of the group dynamic and also everything else that's going on around them. Safe to say that it's a very good film. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed it as well, and I don't know if I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but I know I've definitely mentioned it to both of you. I wasn't a fan of Hereditary. Me I neither. wanted to like it. Yeah, it had everything. I watched the trailer. Everything about it was like, this is going to be great. I'm really looking forward to it. And I just didn't like it. And when I saw the trailer from this summer, I thought, oh, here we go again. Uh, it's going to be austere, no substance. It's not going to be scary. It's not going to be that interesting. It's probably going to bore me. But I, I did, I really enjoyed it. I thought visually it was a stunning film. I looked at it, I thought the acting performances were great, especially with Florence Pugh, who's just excellent. I always love seeing Will Poulton in films. And yeah, I thought it was, it was very much a kind of Ari Aster's take on The Wicker Man, let's be honest. But mm. very creepy, very effective, and even idiots laughing in the cinema couldn't put me off it. 
I don't have anyone laughing this time. Hereditary, towards the end, people were absolutely pissing themselves. And like you, for that reason, I was just kind of like, oh, it's going to be another one of one of those kind of films but I find it an extremely slow burn so if you're going in expecting jump scares and a lot of that kind of, you're going to be really disappointed but I actually liked it for that reason and I thought it was very um what's the word it kind of puts you into a sense of sort of disequilibrium from the start like emotionally you know you're expecting a lot of jump scares but it delivers sort of other um on, on other emotional levels it sort of leaves you kind of wanting a wee bit more from some stuff and really shocked to others and as you guys said, the visuals, you know, the cinematography is absolutely stunning. There's some really beautiful um, overhead shots of the Harga at dinner or performing sort of ritual dances and stuff like that. And it's, you know, it's it's really rooted in, a, in you know, indie cinematography. It's, it's, it's absolutely beautiful to look at, but at the same time, it's almost a kind of unconventional horror. I absolutely loved it. I thought Florence Pugh was great. And for me, it was one of those films that was really sort of primal and earthy and you were kind of involved with it. And it had a distinct sort of rhythm, kind of felt through the sort of breathing and the dances and the rituals that they were doing. You kind of got into that rhythm yourself. And, yeah, know, I thought it was fantastic. I loved it. Yeah, I mean, Florence Pugh is, is great anyway. And she's absolutely brilliant in this. It, she seems to have this, like, constant look on her face the entire film of the person that knows this is going to go tits up. I shouldn't be here. I should leave before everyone dies. It's almost like she's the audience in a way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But there's also that because uh, she's exposed to uh, tragedy quite early on, she's almost like out of it for most of the film, not in terms of like uh, like drugged up or anything, no, there are elements of that. But she seems detached. She's detached from her boyfriend and she's detached from the group. So she is looking at everything almost like from the point of an outsider. Plus, like, in her emotional state, she's kind of prime candidate for joining a cult. Like, she's been gaslighted by her boyfriend, and she's had to deal with extreme family tragedy and a huge change of circumstances that way. And in that sense, she's, you know, a very vulnerable individual, and that tends to be the type of person that these cults pick up. But obviously not all cults. There are some cults out there that I'm sure are doing wonderful work. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I should mention them, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, actually, it's really uncomfortable at the beginning of the film when you're saying she's getting gaslit by her boyfriend and stuff, and she kind of like he invites her on the, the lad's holiday and they don't want her there. All oh, that's really uncomfortable because I think we've all been there at some point. <laughs> oh, yeah, and it's like he's totally on the verge of breaking up with her. This family tragedy happens, and he's like, Oh, well, I can't heap that on top of her now so I'll just stay with her and you can like the, their relationship at the start when they when they get to Sweden is really really fractured because he's sort of only invited her out of sense this misplaced sense of like duty and she doesn't really want to be there she just wants to be with him because it's kind of that's all she's clinging on to um and that's what I mean it's a film that totally unsettles you right from the offset and you never really get that sense of balance like it's never a film that allows you to sort of breathe and go okay things are going to get slightly better here or things are going to return to normal because actually that no no state of normalcy is ever established because it kind of hits you right from the offset um for me it was a huge improvement on hereditary um in terms of even just style hereditary was quite stylish but this is even more so and actually it was a plot that was kind of well thought through right to the end and didn't get per- it does get a wee bit silly, but not kind of on the scale that Hereditary did that actually garnered laughs from the audience. This didn't. To be fair, actually, there was one bit in Midsummer I started laughing towards the end, but it didn't <laughs> ruin it for me. And I didn't laugh because I thought it was stupid. It was just it kind of came out of the blue. And I it kind think of caught I know me off. But you're meaning, yep. Yeah, it caught me off guard and I found myself <laughs> controllably laughing. I think, there was some, like, I think there was some maturity. nervous laughter. No, I think there was some nervous laughter, though. Like, I think the scene in particular where Florence Pugh's down on the floor with all the kind of maidens, and they're all doing that weird sort of, like, labour breathing, like, as if yeah. she's about to give birth, and she's, like, supposed to kind of purge all her sort of negativity. A couple of people maybe sort of laughed a wee bit at that, but actually the more it continued, the more people were kind of holding their breath. It is a, It was a kind of weird sensation. It was like you were invading on somebody's, like, therapy almost it was like a private moment that you maybe shouldn't be looking at there's an awful lot of uh, foreshadowing in the film as well like the first image you actually see is a tapestry and basically it lays out the entire film 
in this tapestry. If you look at it, it tells you everything that's going to happen. It's got the pube cutting on it. No, 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 that's yeah. the second one. No, <laughs> that, yeah. uh, and what the, it's a very subtle device that they use throughout as well. They use uh, paintings and diagrams from like, inside the, the big uh, hall where they all sleep, almost to chapter the film. And it's what's going to happen. But you don't really realise it when you're watching it. It's only if you watch it again, you go, ah, well, that's that bit and that's that bit, you know. And then uh, you see all these sort of things. And you see the second one where uh, somebody goes, oh, what's that there? And it's the one, yeah, with the yeah, with the pubes. And... <laughs> I just wanted uh, to hear you say that. <laughs> the tasty pie. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. But there's quite a lot of that as well. That If you think about it, there's... Uh, when uh, Danny receives the news at first, or tragic news, and the wailing and everything that she does when she's sitting on the couch with her boyfriend, uh, who's aptly named Christian for a film that uh, features a cult, which I thought was quite on the nose. But um, <laughs> the, her wailing, that gets repeated, and there's so many things that get repeated and sort of uh, called back on. For her birthday, she gets a, a drawing of herself, and that drawing informs something that happens later on as well. It's it's very cleverly done, but it's very, very subtle. The emotions in it are incredible. I thought, see that crying that she did on the, the couch, as you see at the beginning, that to me was like, I have sobbed my heart out like that. And I found that very kind of upsetting to watch because it was almost like you were sort of helpless watching her. And it didn't feel like cinema crying, like where they have like one tear rolling down. Their, it was really primal and you know animalistic and there was a lot of like just pure sound and to me that was like it was one of the most realistic depictions of grief I've ever seen it, it was inc an incredible performance. It's what made it so unsettling didn't it? Yeah she was absolutely fantastic in it it was a I mean she has a crack as I said earlier she's a cracking actress and she really kind of excels in this and you mentioned as well about the film being a, a slow burner and it is it really is and it's not overly violent but when there is violence in the film, Jesus, it's <laughs> it's graphic. Yeah. It's hard hitting. It's really effective. Yeah, I mean, you're sitting there for the first hour expecting something to happen, and then there's a ceremony, and there's this guy standing there with a big hammer, and you're going, "What's the big hammer for?" And then you find <laughs> out what the big hammer is actually for. <laughs> yeah. I know you're sitting there like, "Well, this is set in Sweden." Maybe it's something to do with Thor. Oh no, that's fucking Norway. <laughs> oh, cut that. What? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. It's like, it, but for me, it was. I I didn't feel like it, I didn't need the violence. Do you know what I mean? The kind of psychological uncertainty of it all was enough to kind of make me shit myself quite a lot of the time because I think the emotional stuff always hits home a lot more than you know what's essentially fake blood. But I thought the violence was executed very well in the sense that it was kind of everything had a ritual about it. Everything was like this sort of fitted into this kind of pattern of behaviours in amongst the, the Harga. Um, I like the fact that the all the men, uh, they were all anthropology students. So therefore they were studying uh, cultures and peoples. And yet they were some of the most self-absorbed, self-centred people you're ever likely to meet. Even when they were actually researching uh, the the cult and they were going to do their thesis on it and things like that. They they were completely insensitive to uh, the culture that they were actually immersing themselves in. They wanted to take pictures of things all the time and they were trying to one up each other and everything. They're basically just horrible shallow guys who uh, should no be nowhere near anthropology because they've got absolutely nothing in common with anybody. They're just they were just nasty, and I think that was obviously very deliberate in the part of the filmmaker. And interestingly, yeah. for anthropology students, they did not pick up on the cues as to what was coming, because there's a lot of it that's very ritualised and part of history and part of folklore and all the rest of it, and yet, as you said, they're so self-absorbed, they don't seem to see what's awaiting them. Will Poulter's like, uh, peeing on the ancestral tree, <laughs> and lo and behold, some of the elders take real exception to that. And you're just watching the film going, oh, mate, leave. <laughs> just get out where you can. Yeah, yeah, and he's basically just scouting up and down the dinner line, seeing who might fancy him or whatever. That's what he's there for. Not like learning about culture and being part of this kind of ancient civilization or whatever. 
Yeah, and you see, uh, especially the likes of the, the big sort of gatherings, obviously they're all wearing normal clothes and everybody else is wearing white and they're all they're all very still and that sort of reflects the sort of the, the film itself. The film is quite still and it takes its time and all the, the people are part of the commune just they stand and they watch and they observe. But even when uh, the Americans are observing things, they're shuffling about, they're looking at each other, they're not concentrating, they're talking. They're basically just been completely disrespectful and uh, just been like arrogant Westerners, I think is probably a good way to put it. They can come in and do whatever the hell they want. Yep. One of the things about the, and I actually wrote this in the reviews here that I absolutely loved, was, as I said, the sound, this kind of breathing, crying, mourning, but there was a kind of lack of sound as well, because there was no, not that I remember, no, there was kind of like some occasional bits of music, but a lot of it was quite still and quite silent, and a lot of the harga don't wear shoes as well, so they would just sort of enter a scene, but you had no, like there was no sort of audio cues that somebody was coming or approaching because you didn't hear the sound of maybe shoes on grass or shoes on gravel, so that kind of added to the sort of horror thriller element of it as well, because they were just appearing into scenes and you had no sort of warning that something was about to happen. So that was quite interesting as well and that obviously that was part of their culture, but it was sort of used to the advantage of creating this sense of like tension. The film is out in DVD and there is an extended version of the film as well as the regular film. The extended version is 25 minutes longer. And to be honest, I don't think it needed it. It doesn't actually add anything to the film. There's no other subplots or anything getting developed with this extended footage. It just gives a wee bit more sort of meat onto the bones of it, which it actually could have done without. Mary, you just said it was your film of the year up until Joker came out, so I can say to say it's a recommend from you. Absolutely. It's not for everyone, and I think if you're a sort of uh, a jump scare type of horror lover, it's definitely not going to be for you, but I couldn't get enough of it. I thought it was brilliant. John, if you're not watching the director's cut, but just the normal cinema release. Oh, even even the director's cut, I would say, yeah, it's, it's right up there. It was it's one of my favourites from the year as well. But yes. yes, I would definitely recommend it. Yeah, and so with that, I mean, it's not a film I've been in a rush to see again, but I'm glad I did watch it. Uh, it has, I don't think it'll make my top ten, but I did enjoy it, and yeah, I would recommend it. And that's a unanimous recommend for Ari Aster's Midsummer. And it's out now in Blu-ray, DVD, download, Cody, sorry, scratch that last one. <laughs> but yeah, go watch it. If you have seen it, let us know what you think in the usual means. It's sort of a crazy festival. Special ceremonies and dressing up. That sounds fun. Unbelievable. Welcome and happy Midsummer. Skull! Midsummer, big theme is cults. So we looked at our top three, not necessarily our top three films that have cults in them, but top three cults in film. Now, we've all got our individual lists as usual, going by the draft pick. We made Mary pick last this time, so we could ensure she didn't just steal all our picks. And as I had the pleasure of choosing first this time, I'm going to go first. And I'm going to go with David Fincher's Fight Club. Which, when you think of movies with cults in them, you think more kind of horror movies, something kind of sinister, supernatural even. Not necessarily Fight Club, but let's be honest, this film centres around a massive, massive cult. Stars Brad Pitt as Tyler Durden and... What's his name again? Christ. Ed Norton as... The unnamed narrator. They basically start an unlikely friendship and form an underground fight club where losers basically turn up and uh, fight each other to try and instill some meaning in their life. It gets out of hand. They become a militia and they basically do anything that their cult leader, Tyler Durden, tells them to, which includes blowing up buildings, beating up people and cutting the balls off traitors. I love Fight Club. It's one of my favourite movies. I mean, most cults centre around, you know, one person's personality or charisma. And I think that's, you know, I think that's quite applicable here. I think certainly the, maybe sometimes the sort of violence associated with cults, um, 
you know, is more seen in a sort of massive scale. We talk about like, you know, fascists or whatever. But this is very much almost kind of clockwork orangey and it's it's appeal. I think it's a great film. They do have their own twisted logic in what they're fighting against. But again, yeah, it all comes down to the fact that they're following the words of a, a man who may or may not exist. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm sure we can do spoilers. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure we can. It's like, you know, who is Kaiser Sozi? Like, we're over that now. <laughs> My first pick is Paul Thomas Anderson's The Master from 2012. It stars uh, Joaquin Phoenix as Freddie Quell, who's a World War II veteran who has fallen in hard times after uh, he gets demobbed. And after... Um, basically working his way through anything he can get his hands on to drink. He ends up at the door of Lancaster Dodd, who's played by Philip Seymour Hoffman. Now, Philip Seymour Hoffman is the man who is in charge of the cult in this particular film. Um, It's called The Cause. Now, The the Cause is uh, an organisation that sort of puts forward the ideas of Dianetics, which is obviously very close to Scientology. They don't actually mention Scientology at all during the film, but it's it's actually quite clear that that's what it's based on. And again, it's another one of these cult of personality films. It's the charismatic leader and uh, his word and his teachings that um, affect Freddy because Freddy is a lost soul and he's looking for something. He's prime material, like Mary mentioned in Midsummer. Um, he's a, a character who is looking for something and it just so happens that this comes along and he's he will do anything at all in order to be part of it now where that leads to is obviously quite deep and dark it's not a a, a fun film by any means it's quite harrowing and it also obviously puts uh, the cause into a bit of a bad light as well by the way that they uh, treat people who are no longer welcome within their their ranks and people who uh, tend to disagree with them from outside as well. Freddie becomes a bit of a, almost like a hitman. He tends to shout down and then uh, actually physically assault people uh, who get in the way of his ideal and the way of uh, Dodd's teachings as well. It's a pretty good movie. What do you guys think? So I'd never seen The Master, but I knew what it was kind of based on. I didn't realise it was so blatantly <laughs> based on. I mean, it's like, we don't want to mention Scientology specifically. So we'll just talk about Dianetics by R. Lon Hubbard. <laughs> you know, it's like, I didn't realise it was so clearly based on it. But I haven't seen it, unfortunately. I do want to, though. It clearly references the L. Ron Hubbard era when he was living on a boat um, in order to avoid taxes, I think, and general other things. But the chemistry between Philip Seymour Hoffman and Joaquin Phoenix is outstanding. The scene that stands out for me is when Philip Seymour Hoffman sings that kind of weird song to him. It's like, I want to take you on a slow boat to China. And it just closes up on the two guys' face. It sort of alternates between their reactions and... That was some tense and weird cinema. That is, I loved that film. That that scene always stands out to me as being the sort of one of the weirder moments. It was brilliant. My pick is Mandy, which I only saw a few months ago. Um, and to be honest with you, it wasn't a film that I was particularly interested in. Um, starring Nicolas Cage, and that's probably why, if I'm being honest, I wasn't really interested in it. So him and he plays Red, who's like a kind of lumberjack, and him and his wife, uh, played by Andrea. Riseborough, she's called Mandy, live out in the edge of a forest and she's this sort of trippy, kind of long-haired, sort of painting, weird paintings, reading science fiction type of hippie woman and she happens to catch the attention of a local cult leader played by Linus Roach who is the son of Ken Barlow from Coronation Street which is a really weird random fact and so this cult leader sort of falls in love with her and decides that he must have her so he kidnaps her and the sort of main story of the film is um, basically Nicolas Cage going on a murderous rampage to get her back. It is a film that 
genuinely makes you feel like you're on a fuck ton of drugs for a lot of the time <laughs> it's really trippy the music's really trippy the cinematography a lot of the scenes are kind of swathed in this pink light and it does it feels like you've taken acid it is absolutely nuts and this cult is this you know they've got these weird kind of people dressed in like gimp suits going out on motorbikes with these sort of self-made horrific weapons you know they meet in this kind of underground um cavern where a uh, linus roach's character sort of you know naked and everyone's bowing down and they all love him and stuff like that it is absolutely mental when you think of like you know you end up down the rabbit hole at two in the morning on reddit reading about weird cults this would be up there if this was a real life a uh, cult it is absolutely you know mental and there's a scene with nick cage standing in a pair of like ill-fitting y fronts in a bathroom blood all over his face screaming holding a bottle of vodka it was crazy from start to finish i absolutely loved it <laughs> Yeah, I saw it last year at uh, Sitches uh, with an audience, and it's a brilliant film to watch with an audience, it's especially the, the primal scream Nicolas Cage moment. That's just amazing, seeing him. But I, I like the fact that it was like completely oversaturated colours and everything, and uh, the biker gang, the, uh, the cult, call upon to do their bidding and everything. Yeah, it was just it was uh, an absolutely far-out film. Very good. Yeah. I will get round to it at some point, I'm sure. You would love I it. Do. I mean, honestly, you would absolutely love it. Yeah. Well, my second pick, I'm going to go with an old classic in The Wicker Man. Nice. I was going to um, say which version, the Nick Cage version or not. <laughs> well, as much as I love the original, I'm going to go with Nick nah. <laughs> the Nicolas Cage version. As much as I do genuinely love Nicolas Cage, is horrifically bad. Uh, although the only saving grace is him screaming about the bees at the end of it. No, of course, I am speaking about the original 1973 British horror film directed by Robin Hardy, starring Edward Woodward, Britt Eklund, Ingrid Pitt and Christopher Lee. This film doesn't really need much of an introduction. Edward Woodward is a small town cop sent to this island to investigate a disappearance. He doesn't know that this seemingly harmless cult are actually a bit nuts and they want to sacrifice somebody and by burning them alive and a big massive wicker man so they can get good crops or something. I can't even remember the reason behind it but the film is genuinely terrifying and so effective the fact that the majority of the film is set during the day. It's broad daylight and it's horrible that this seemingly harmless cult are actually a bit nuts and they want to sacrifice somebody and by burning them alive and a big massive wicker man so they can get good crops or something. I can't even remember the reason behind it but the film is genuinely terrifying and it's so effective the fact that the majority of the film is set during the day. It's broad daylight and it's horrible. <laughs> it really is. You really feel for Edward Woodward's character as he's trapped in this island. He has no friends. Everybody he bumps into are all in cahoots against him. Christopher Lee is absolutely fantastic as just being Christopher Lee and being evil and creepy. And yeah, it's just, it's always seen as one of the most classic best horror films ever. It's hard for me to argue. I think it's an absolute masterpiece. And the ending, it just, you talk about like, Midsummer being a slow burner. The Wicker Man's a slow burner. <laughs> and the third act, building up to the finale, is dragged out very uncomfortably to the point of just like, please just end. This has <laughs> to stop sooner or later. And it doesn't. And it just keeps going and going and going. And it's not an overly graphic film. It's not very, very violent. It's really psychological and it just really sticks with you. Yep. Awesome, Joyce. I completely agree. The ending of that film, I always remember it was like on ITV4 or something at like two in the morning. So, as usual, I couldn't sleep. And I remember just watching it. And the ending of that film, which I won't spoil people who haven't seen it, I, I will never get out of my head. It's, yeah, it's one of those iconic cinema moments. I, I get what you mean about dragging it out. It's brilliant. Yeah, I like the way that, like you said, Sammy, it's grim. Everything about it's grim because it's, it's set on an island. I think it was filmed in the. South 
west of Scotland, down sort of Dumfries away. Yeah. And uh, it's grim down there anyway, because I used to spend summers down there. So <laughs> it, it wasn't great. But yes, it, it really captures the sort of the isolation and the fact that the, the, the way that it's shot and everything as well, it's quite grey a lot of the time. You know, there's, there's not a lot of colour to it, and that kind of reflects... Uh, in the sort Scotland. of situation, <laughs> right, well, yeah, it reflects Scotland in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> On your pick. My second pick is a film called The Endless, which was from 2017. Um, basic story of it is is just two guys, they're brothers, who escaped from a, a UFO death cult in their early teens, and they basically got lots of counselling and stuff and they've started to have a sort of semi-normal life, albeit with a lot of therapy and everything going on. And then they receive a video cassette from uh, their former friends at the cult. They're called uh, Camp Arcadia. And they decide to go back to see what it's all about, what's going on. One of the brothers uh, was a little older, so he realised what was going on or what he what he thought was going on was not a good thing and he obviously took the uh, his own good advice and basically get out while he could whereas his younger brother didn't have the same sort of memories he enjoyed himself he's he's obviously got very fond memories of everything going on there so they go back to the cult and everything seems just as they left. Everybody seems roughly about the same age and they're all very welcoming and everything. And over the course of three nights, uh, they find out pretty much what's going on and why they were actually called back. And it is creepy and scary and uh, more psychologically tense than actual horror tense. There's not a lot of... Uh, sort of jumps or scares in it but it's the the build up of the sort of the dread you you know something's going to happen and they stretch it out and they stretch it out and you only see it, everything from the perspective of the brothers so you don't really know what's going on you're only aware of what they're aware of so everybody they meet seems very nice and calm and you're kind of thinking oh, they're a bit too calm <laughs> which is never a good sign you always want a bit of life about people so um it's one of these films that kind of flew under the radar a wee bit, but it's it's definitely worth seeking out. I, I really recommend it. Yeah, I've never heard of that at all. Mm. Like when you That's mentioned it. it earlier, I've had to go and uh, IMDb it, but it sounds absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it kind of came and went. It was, I think, it was really just a a DVD release. Again, it was one uh, I saw at a film festival last year. So, and it was one of these ones that I just it was a sort of a blind buy, just something to fill up a wee bit of time and uh, it was actually really worthwhile. The, I'd read a couple of interviews with the guys who made it as well, uh, Justin Benson and Arden Moorhead, and they've been working together for years and they were totally committed to this and it's made in a sort of shoestring budget as well and just the, what they've actually got out of it is just, you know, it's something quite special and it's a slightly different take on uh, the sort of the whole cult thing as well. They they don't paint them as being totally horrible people, but obviously there's quite a lot going on there at the same time. Mary, um, so I'm obsessed with like religious fervor. Like I I love when you find some absolutely crazy, um, usually American group of people who are convinced that you know they have to bury themselves underground and the world's going to end and all that sort of shit. So I love anything like that that I can get my hands on. So my second pick is Red State, um, starring Melissa Leo and John Goodman. And basically, it's kind of like, I think they're supposed to be almost like Seventh Day Adventists. I think they have another name. So not that, obviously, but there's this religious, you know, Christ, extreme Christian religious cult. And it starts off three teenage friends. They're basically trying to hook up with a woman for sex, meet online or whatever. And before they know it, they're drinking beers and they wake up basically inside this cult. And, you know, it starts off like 
at 11 this film you know the the boys wake up and they're like they've been like duct taped on this altar um, and they're absolutely screaming I'm pretty sure they've got ball gags in as well they're absolutely screaming they don't know where they are they're obviously surrounded by all these you know um, religious fundamentalists and this um, religious family or organisation whatever you want to call them are basically armed to the teeth because the ATF this branch of the American police um, want to storm their building and they're sort of using these boys as kind of bait and the whole thing is, you know, it's like one big giant shoot off. You know, these boys are begging for their lives. And these, you know, this religious group led by uh, John Goodman's uh, pastor character obviously don't want to be arrested because they've, you know, there's allegations of, you know, torture and all that sort of thing as well. Um, it is absolutely terrifying. Like religious fervor in itself is quite freaky. You know, people all speaking in tongues and fainting and all that sort of thing. But when you add in like, you know, an absolute you know weaponry of you know like machetes and um all these guns and stuff like that is it starts off at a super high level as i say these boys begging for their lives and it just it builds and builds from there and if you're you know if you're wanting just basically a good old-fashioned shootout this is a kind of you know a great film about you know religious cults to to watch it's again it was one that i think i saw like a totally random pick on like a tuesday morning or something like that at a cinema and uh, I remember walking out the cinema feeling absolutely traumatised by what I'd just seen. It was so emotionally, like, I've just left the film like, wow, that has drained me. But really good film. I don't, and nobody's really heard of it, but I, it's one of those ones that it's like a go-to kind of, you know, just for pure violence. See, that's a film. And I first seen the trailer for it, I was thinking to myself, this is looking quite interesting. And then it was like uh, directed by that Kevin Smith. And I was like, oh, Kevin Smith is really kind of changing, the, changing up his genre here. And I thought the film looked absolutely incredible. And I, thought, I can't wait to see this. And I didn't like it. Oh, uh, uh, no. I did. It was that kind of way. Like, I thought the premise was great. I really enjoyed it for the most part. And then I thought it just came out flying off the rails. Went a bit silly. Turned into a kind of slapstick comedy at times. It was a bit stupid. And I just, yeah. I thought it was a film that looked great. The trailer really sold it to me. And I didn't think it delivered the same way. I think that's why I liked it because it just kept ramping up and okay, this stuff was getting a wee bit ridiculous, but I kind of, I think that's what I was hoping for almost because it was like a shootout kind of situation. Um, and as I say, I'm kind of obsessed by religious fundamentalists. So I'm like, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy, your last pick. I am going to go with a film that I don't actually like, but <laughs> I have to mention it because it, it's, it's stuck with me. I mean, I've seen this film loads of times as well. This was, this was during a time when like, streaming services didn't exist. And I would watch like the Halloween series on repeat. And this includes Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. Now, anybody that's seen the first Halloween film, and maybe thought, yeah, do you know what? I've gave up. He's evil incarnate. There's not much of a backstory regarding him. Uh, he's a young kid. He killed his sister. He grew up to be a serial killer. It happens. He's quite hard to kill, but for all intents and purposes, he's just a guy. Oh, not in Halloween 6. Basically, it turns out that Michael has uh, been like, cursed by this ancient druid curse called the Curse of Thorn. It's a mystical symbol that gives him his immortality and makes him want to kill. And this cult basically surrounds the film that they try and use Michael for their own ends and stuff. And it's absolutely horrific. It's terrible. They basically took this amazing, great premise from the first movie. Don't know what they were thinking. They tried to explain why he is the way he is. And you're just like, ah. I'm not going to lie, that sounds absolutely shite. It's horrific, but it's worth watching. And <laughs> it follows on for Halloween 5, the Revenge of Michael Myers, with the whole curse and the cult first introduced. At the end of that film, he gets arrested and he's in jail. And the cult break him out of jail. Now, <laughs> we're talking about a, a motto, serial killer, cursed, demon-type entity who gets arrested. The film is so bad that they erased it from the series not once, but twice. <laughs> because Halloween H2O is a direct sequel to Halloween 2. And the last Halloween film is a direct sequel to the first one. <laughs> this film's been erased from the timeline twice it's not very good now, is it watchable? yeah it's very watchable because it's so bad it's good it's very notable as well as the final film by Do Donald Pleasance was in 
Now, Donald Pleasance, who played Dr. Loomis in the Halloween series, even in a film this bad, he's still very good in it. He's great. He, he has a big, great performance. And it's also the, the movie where Paul Rudd made his acting starring debut. Oh, oh wow. that makes me so sad. Paul Rudd so deserves would, so much better. I would recommend you go and see it, but you probably want to see Halloween 1, 2, 4 and 5 for some context. <laughs> You what if three. you pick and stuff that's like five or six into a franchise? I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> I've been trying to figure that out for a while. <laughs> well, I can't say I've seen it, and to be honest with you, I can't say I'm going to seek it out, but I'll take your word for it. I think you should all go and see it. <laughs> John? Uh, I'm going to change my last pick. <gasps> I was originally going to pick Kill List, but I've thought of a... Uh, a better one, well, but not better, but um, uh, probably a better cult. Uh, I'm going to choose Beneath the Planet of the Apes, which is the second oh. film in the, the series. Uh, basically, uh, Charlton heston because he disappears at the very start of it. So somebody who looks a wee bit like him, I think he's got, probably got the same hair colour and about the same size. Uh, he takes over. Uh, the guy's called Brent rather than... Uh, Heston's tailor, and he uh, escapes from the ape city and ventures into the Forbidden Zone, where they go underground and they meet the the cult that uh, basically worship the nuclear bomb. Now, this was one of the sort of the earlier films I saw. I saw it on television years ago when I was maybe off, must have been only about ten or something, and it scared the crap out of me with this. Now I'm going to spoil this for people who have never seen Beneath the Planet Apes. I mean, it was only released in 1970, so you may not have seen that. <laughs> but basically, because they've been worshiping this nuclear bomb, they've all been affected by radiation. So they're all basically wearing masks. And when they take off the masks, they're all horrifically deformed underneath it and uh, basically with radiation burns. And it scared the crap out of me when I was wee. Just this 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 idea. And obviously you're, you're talking about being in the middle of the sort of the Cold War and everything as well. This is sort of the uh, mid-70s and everything. So the, the fear of a nuclear winter was really uh, quite high upon everybody's uh, thoughts at that point as well. So it was, it was quite... Uh, present at the time and it's just one of these films that stayed with me especially because of these bomb worshipping cultists which let's face it we've still got today <laughs> in one form or another one of whom is in the White House yeah. I didn't want to say that in case the CIA stop our podcast. Oh, I've already maybe, said, maybe. I've already slagged off Scientology. I'm done for anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like I think this next podcast would just go just me and you, John. <laughs> maybe he's going to, dis- maybe he's going to disappear in the middle of the night. Well, my last pick, as John knows, since it was going to be his last pick, is um, Hot Fuzz. And I'm, I can totally spoil this because it's on ITV2 like every weekend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so obviously Simon Pegg is a policeman, but he's like a, you know, inner city London policeman. So he's just everything moving really slickly and he moves to this tiny village where uh, Nick Frost is a policeman and Bill Bailey's in there as well. And it's this really kind of sleepy, sort of typical English village. But there's these really weird, creepy murders going on, including like, you know, shears to the throat and you know, people disappearing. And nobody can quite work out what's going on but no, none of the villagers seem really inclined to do so as well because that's just their way of doing things they're a small sleepy town and it turns out at the heart of this town is a big old massive cult who are you know being led by the likes of um timothy dalton and his little sexy voice and jim broadbent as well and a whole host of sort of you know english character actors who you sort of know and love and what I love about it is, you know, typical Edgar Wright humour. It's fast, it's slick. There's a weird shootout in a supermarket that isn't a shootout because all they've got is like peas and plastic forks. And, you know, the amazing scenes of them all draped in their cloaks with the candles under their faces, you know, and everything's for the greater good. I think the greater Edward, good. Yep. Edward <laughs> Woodward's in there as well. It's just, it's an absolutely brilliant piece of, you know, British comedy. And it's, you know, to- totally taking the piss out of, you know, small village life and the sort of, not the the cults that go on in small villages in England, but that sort of sense of, you know, neighbourhood and community and how it all sort of get linked together and everything's got to do with, you know, the keeping the keeping the village perfect and not having people spoil the, you know, the nicely cut lawns and, you know, no lager lights, all this sort of thing. And 
it's just a you know really satirical, absolutely brilliant piece of cinema, um, and not your sort of typical cult because it's not a it's not a horror. Yeah, I'm quite liking these picks actually because I mean when we first kind of broached this topic, I thought it was all going to be horror films, and that was my thought process and thinking of them. But yeah, Hot Fuzz is a good one, and it's very very valid. Yeah, Timothy Dalton mentioning there. <laughs> Timothy Dalton is fantastic in that film. He's absolutely brilliant. I love He's him. also the best James Bond, so, you know. Well, that's a podcast <laughs> for another time. You're right, Thomas. It will be just you and me doing the next one because Mary's definitely going to get taken away in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to social media now to see what people have gave us in their picks. And their own David Broken has given us quite a few. He's one of the obvious ones in his words. Wicker Man. Temple of Doom, The Master, Eyes Wide Shut, Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene. That's a great film. I've never heard of it. It's with, um, what do you call her? Elizabeth Olsen. Oh, that's I like Elizabeth film. Olsen. I might watch yeah, it. That's a great and he also wants me to mention the Simpsons episode with the John Cult, if you can count that. And I think we should because it's a brilliant episode. Sure. Over on uh, Twitter, we have long-time loyal listener, Dr. Bob Steele. And he's went with The Wicker Man as well. And Conan the Barbarian. And The Devil Rides Out. Now, I know The Devil Rides Out is quite a famous one, like The Wicked Man, but I've never seen it. Neither have I. No, me neither, no. Even though it's got war notes in it, you know, and you can't beat a bit of war notes. That is us all culted out for <laughs> our theme <laughs> on cult in relation to Midsummer of Ari Aster. As we said, it's out in DVD and Blu-ray just now, and we all do recommend it, as we do Halloween 6. What do you think? It's like another world. Tomorrow's a big day. Is it scary? There's not been a lot of film news recently, unfortunately. It's just been the same nonsense regarding let's ask some old director if he likes Marvel films and some made-up Joker controversy. So, as it's Halloween, we're all going to pick a film each that we think you should watch this Halloween. John, what is your pick? My pick's Adam's Family Values. The sequel to The Adam's Family. It's a brilliant film that the whole family can watch. It's Obviously, based on the, the TV show, The Adams Family from the 60s, Raul Julia is uh, absolutely brilliant in the sort of lead role as Gomez. You've got Angelica Houston as his uh, seductive, slinky wife, Morticia, and the rest of the gang, uh, like Pudsley and all that. So just Sorry, Pugsley, I should say. But it's just a fantastic film, just really, really funny. And as I say, everybody can watch it, so it's a sort of perfect fair for Halloween. Yeah, we were talking about Adam's Family today, actually, and work because the new animated film out. Then yeah. we were talking about the, the two films, and yeah, I mean, the, the cast in that film is absolutely amazing, absolutely perfect, and the chemistry with Raul Julia and Angelica Houston is totally on point, as is the chemistry with Christopher Lloyd and mm-hmm. Christina oh, Ricci. fantastic, in it? Yeah, because yeah. at one point he brings his new girlfriend in, and she says, she says, isn't he a lady killer? And he says, not proven. <laughs> <laughs> it's John Cusack, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a brilliant pick, John. That's a that's a brilliant pick. Maybe that is, okay. that's totally not what I thought you were going to say. Um, I'm going to go down the more conventional route because I think it's my favourite horror of all time, and it's kind of similar to what you were saying about the Wicker Man being set in the daytime. I think this Halloween everyone should watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original. It's <laughs> an absolutely not for all the family, um, but it's a brilliant horror. Um, it's kind of, it was, you know, you read all the stories about it, about oh, how all the props were rotten and their clothes were stinking and it just, it just all adds to the kind of a folklore of watching it and, you know, the dinner table scene alone is, is worth it. It's one of my all-time favourite horrors. Brilliant. Nice. Interesting. The, show, yeah. the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the first film that I saw on video. We, back in, I think it was 1982, we got a video recorder and it was a big deal then. It was this big blocky Ferguson VHS job and uh, obviously there was very few videos you could actually get and one of them was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So my dad got that and we all sat and watched it as a family with my <laughs> granny and we sat and watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and 
everybody loved it, especially the dinner scene. Oh, oh he's still alive, you know. It's, yeah. it's, it's one of these films that will stay with me forever just because of uh, that, that memory, you know, the early days of watching home entertainment videos. Yeah, I'm going to go very conventional, very obvious one here, but needs no introduction. Halloween, John Carpenter's first uh, for the, sorry, first entry in the franchise by John Carpenter. It's an uh, absolutely exceptional movie. It still holds up to this day. Um, it's creepy. It's scary. Yeah, it just... You, we all know the film. We all know what it's about. If you haven't seen it, though, definitely watch it. And if you have seen it, watch it again anyway. <laughs> and if, you, if you're not interested in watching it for the 1500th time, I would watch last year's Halloween. Watch the new one. It's very, very good. Don't look at yeah. that, Mary. <laughs> I did not no, like that film. <laughs> no, you, you're right. The last one was worth a show. It's, it's actually a pretty good movie, but it's nothing compared to the original. No, it's not. I mean, it's a very, very good sequel, let's be honest. And which, when you've got Halloween 60 to contend with, doesn't really say much. <laughs> and films with Buster Rhymes. However, it is a cracking film. And yeah, but my, my, my pick is going to be the first Halloween film. Yeah. Uh, not Do the first it? slasher movie, but one of the first, and it did influence the entire generation. Yeah. Do you know the one yeah. Halloween film I still can't actually make it through, and I've probably only seen about 5% of because I'm such a shite bag? The Exorcist. I cannot. Like, I, I'm behind the cushion, I'm turning it off, or I'm actually just looking the complete opposite way. I cannot do it, and I cannot bring myself to watch the full thing. And I think that's testament to how much that film has held up, even though it's, what, 40 years old or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I actually went to see the stage show of that last month. And There's a stage show? Yeah, and it's Ian McKellen does a voice of the devil. I do not need that in my life. It's another film that also went off the rails by its... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the second one, actually. The Her- it's got The Heretic. I think it- I'm sure that also revolves on a cult as well. But let's be honest, I think there's three Exorcist films, if you don't count the prequels they went and made later on. Mm-hmm. But the best Exorcist sequel out there is Repossessed. That's a brilliant film. Maybe look at me. You've not seen Repossessed? Are you joking? No, never seen it, no. Leslie Nielsen. Oh, yeah, my Okay. I have seen it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe go and watch the trailer for Repossessed. Do you like the Naked Gun films? I love them. I love it's them. It's basically a spoof of The Exorcist, but it's a sequel. So it's set like 20 years later when. Right, okay. Um, what do you call the. Get again. Reagan. Linda Blair, isn't Reagan. It? It's been yeah. Re- yeah, it's been Reagan grows up, but Linda Blair's in the film. Yeah. All uh, right. Okay. okay. And it's a stupid, crazy, madcap, naked gun airplane style comedy, but Linda Blair's in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that I maybe would enjoy if, if it's a comedy. <laughs> it's great. That's my second drink my recommendation for Halloween. <laughs> Well, if that's us with our Halloween cult-themed podcast, yeah. I think all we've got left to do is wrap it up. So and ask you to is... subscribe to the cult of music, movie scramble, obviously. Yes, yeah, so subscribe to your cult and our charismatic and wonderful cult leader, John. <laughs> Let him lead the way. <laughs> you would make an excellent cult leader. They'd all be clamouring to get a wee touch of your hair. <laughs> Please Maybe. email him, for the love of God. Please email yeah. him. He's so lonely. Many, many try, few succeed. <laughs> Do you want me to email address again? It is podcast at moviescramble.co.uk. Now we've received one, but that was from me as a test just to make sure it was actually working. <laughs> I got so excited there. <laughs> me too. <laughs> oh, no, Another geez. false dawn. <laughs> you can also find if you don't work them. No, as I think so many people try to email at the same time. It's just cracking that's the same. Can't get through. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. 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 They also to... maybe don't know how to address our dear leader because you know they've never seen such radiant hair before, so we just they're not sure. Well, if Grey can be radiant, then you know. <laughs> you can also contact us at Movie Scramble on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please do. We love to hear what you think of the podcast and just your general film chat. Because you're good. In fact, another re- recommend, uh, recommendation, sorry, a shout out to a uh, good friend of the podcast. It's also on our movie site, so controversial. But they're at the People's Movies on Twitter, and these guys have been very interactive with us and very supportive of the podcast and just generally good people. So 
yeah, thanks for the support, guys, and uh, good luck with your own website. Yeah, uh, it's Paul Devine that runs the website. Nice guy. Uh, met him quite a few times. He goes to various uh, screenings that I sometimes get to go to, and I've hooked up with him a couple of times at the film festival and stuff. So, yes, I good shout out to him. He's obviously got, he, he obviously likes us a lot. I've got no idea why. Why are you both on? <laughs> <laughs> I have been no help this entire podcast. I'm so sorry. When it calm down now and be a mature adult. <laughs> yes, just as we're finishing. Yes, well done. <laughs> John, Mary, thanks for your time. Thanks everybody for listening. We hope you enjoyed it, and we will be back in a couple of weeks with something else. I'm sure. There's some good stuff coming out. Some stuff, good stuff coming out. So, whether we will review something new, something blue, something blue, stay tuned and we'll let you know. Bye. 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 I don't know why you invited us. That's why you look so guilty right now because you know. We only do this every 90 years. I was most excited for you to come.